overcome us when we're at our worst. Lord, and, and just overwhelm us and fill us with joy when we're at our best. Thank you for your Father's love. And Heavenly Father, as we learn more about what your love means for how we live our lives, I just really pray that you would just lift up your word this evening. Lord, that you would speak to us. Lord, we know that your word is living and active. Lord God, it doesn't return empty. Speak to each one of us and help us to live a courageous life in your love. We love you, Lord, and we just are expectant and full of faith that you will come and meet us. Amen. Amen. Please do take a seat. Uh, My name's Dave. If I haven't met you before, I'm a member of the congregation here, and I'm speaking on this, the second week of our series in King David. And we're looking at this man because in the Bible, he's described in a whole kind of raft of different ways, but one of them is that King David is a man after God's own heart. And we want to be people who are after God's own heart. But also David is shown to be someone who, uh, who is a little picture and a shadow, a little taste of what the true son of God will be like. And so through this series, we want to see what does it mean to be a man or a woman after God's own heart? And what does it mean? Uh, and you know, how, what can we learn from David about our King Jesus? And today, we're looking at a very famous story of David and Goliath. So if you'd turn with me uh, in your Bibles, um, we're turning to page 203, 203. Um, and we're going to read the first half of this chapter uh, entitled David and Goliath. It's page 203. And it's chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Socha in Judea. They pitched camp at Ephaz, Damin, between Socha and and Azacha. Almost got there. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley in between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head. He wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron points weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, You will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So as we come to read this, um, I wonder if anybody in the next kind of couple of weeks has a a kind of an appointment in the diary to attack any nine feet people or to slay any enemies of of another tribe. This kind of feels like something that's quite far removed from uh, the modern day. You know, it it, it feels like it's from another time. Um, But what we want to do today is to really kind of dig down into this book into uh, this story and actually understand that what's going on here is the same way that the devil and the world and sometimes our own flesh has been attacking us all the time of our lives. Intimidation. Fear. This story is so famous, it's become such a firm part of our culture and our Sunday school that it kind of feels like, I don't know, like odd preparing a message on it. But digging deeper, we can find themes here that are incredibly powerful, that can come alive uh, in our hands. And, and whilst I said that today's message is about how we get attacked with intimidation and fear, 
the main part of today's message is about God's call on our lives as his followers to be courageous. So today is about courage. It offers us a call to courageous living and offers us a power and a way of thinking by which we can overcome this intimidation. So I want you to kind of work really hard with me today to try and work out, well, okay, so this story, I know it, I've heard it a thousand times, um, it seems a long time ago, but actually no, like what is the power to overcome intimidation for us in this, uh, in this passage? And to look at this, I want to look at kind of two rounds of a fight. And uh, in round one, we're going to be looking at the heavyweight champion of Israel, Saul, as he takes on Goliath. And any kind of pre-match interview uh, would, you know, do a bit of a bio on the characters. So let's do some, uh, you know, let's do some kind of digging. Let's work out Saul and his recent history. What are his odds? Well, Saul is the king of Israel. He was anointed such, uh, and actually as a king of Israel, he is a defeater of the Philistines. He's gone after these people. He's had victories in battle. And actually, he has managed to unite the people behind him. At the beginning, it was a bit of a shaky start. He was kind of this young pretender. But actually, we see the people have united. He's consolidated. He's in actually a pretty strong position. He's probably pretty ready for a fight. And actually, one other thing we know that's explicitly told us in the Bible is that we know that Saul is at least one head, one head taller than any other Israelite in the entire nation. He's a physical guy. He's a good-looking guy. He seems to be ready for action. In terms of you know, what he brings to the party, his, his main strengths, his size, and his experience. You know, this is the guy you want at the helm. Though it doesn't seem that everything is going completely to plan. So things on the outside look pretty good, but actually we've seen some signs in Saul's life in his recent kind of history that might show some level of insecurity. He seems to be on the back foot quite often. We notice, actually looking at Saul's life, that he's not one to go out and take a risk. He's one to kind of make sure he's done the count, make sure things are ready to go. He's quite conservative. In our Bible study at our life group, when we looked at Saul in detail this week, uh, somebody came up with this point that I'd never thought about before. Saul has an inferiority complex. Like, he's the one who's hiding um, when he was elected to be king. He doesn't quite believe that he's got the stuff inside of him to really lead the charge. So whilst the outside looks pretty good, I wonder uh, if there's something on the inside that's, that's on shaky ground. We've all got some Saul in us. We're all risk-averse and conservative. We all have this imposter syndrome. We don't quite believe that we are actually good enough to be doing what we are. That's just a part of our humanity that we wrestle with. Maybe Saul wrestled with this in a particular way as well. But actually, Saul seems to be on a high. Things seem to be going well. He seems to be getting over some of these complexes. But then just when things were looking pretty good, you know, boom, like wham, out comes Goliath. A champion named Goliath, who is from Gath, he came out, he was six cubits high, that's nine feet high. Nine feet high. Matty, how tall are you? Tiny, six foot something. Matty is minuscule. That cross is about eight foot tall. Nine foot high. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he wore a coat of armour weighing 5,000 shekels. 5,000 shekels is about 67 ki- sorry, 57 kilos. Uh, you know, there are some people in this room who weigh 57 kilos, like, kind of like carrying one of us kind of on, his, on his chest. And that's, he's, then he's got kind of the shin pads. And this guy is absolute intimidation from the tip of his javelin through to his shin guards. Just to get a feel for this, this guy is probably one of the most kind of dangerous uh, people to run into on a, you know, on, on a, on a modern street. This is uh, Nikolai Valuev. He's, uh, he was the kind of a heavyweight boxing champion of the world for a while. He was seven foot two. Um, and you didn't really want to get across him in a fight. Many boxers sign up to fight this guy 
met him in a post-match interview, and apparently on more than one occasion, after the, kind of the pre-match interview, they backed out of the fight. They took one look at how long his arms were and how big he was. Yeah, this is someone who's two feet shorter than Goliath. So this is, kind of the, this is the intimidation. This is where we're going. And, and like a good boxer, Goliath had some chat. He could absolutely sling it like the best of them. Goliath stood, verse 8. He stood and shouted at the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man, having come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome and kill him, then you will become our subjects and serve us. This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man. Let us fight each other. You might ask why I've started this face-off as Saul and Goliath. That's not what it's called in your Bible. It's called David and Goliath. But Saul should have been the guy. He should have been the guy. It should have been Saul. He was the king. Don't think about our queen. You know, kind of, she's not going to come out in a little kind of buggy and start fighting giants. But kings in ancient times were the warriors. They were the leaders. They led from the front. He was also the tallest guy. We see explicitly he was the tallest one. And I just wonder if there's something about this that's particularly pertinent, right? What was his strength all through his life with his brothers, with his peers, in athletics class, in battle? I'm the tall one. I'm the tall one. That's his strength. It's going to be okay because I'm really tall. He's probably never seen anyone taller than him. And how does he get attacked? Someone three foot taller than he is. What an intimidation. What he thought was his special skill. Actually, that wasn't enough to give him the self-confidence. It wasn't enough because what was his seen as his strength, that was what the enemy came to attack. And what happened? This is what happens when you meet a Goliath. It starts off with this intimidation, this big, intimidating force, which stirs up the fear the fear leads you to be back foot and passive. And if you're passive for too long, you just get stuck. You just get stuck. We find out as we read on in the passage that actually these guys on the battle lines, where they're out there, they're ready for war, they're eating, drinking, they're bringing supplies to the front. They were there for 40 days. 40 days of absolute gridlock. Uh, and there was not... Uh, no, no movement forward, no movement back. Let's um, step outside of this a little bit. Let's step outside the story and think about what this means for us. Does anybody here, you know, it's like, does anyone here have problems that are bigger than they are? You know, who doesn't? Who doesn't, from time to time, come across something that's just bigger than you? Some of these are internal problems. Addictions are bigger than us. And if you've, had the, you know, if you've had the misfortune to come across an addiction, then you'll know that it's bigger. The first step of Alcoholics Anonymous's 12-step program is to, is to admit just that. Look, I can't control this. It's bigger than me. Depression is bigger than us. It can grow and swell and it can become something that is too big for us. Guilt and memories and patterns of thought, that, that, that thing that you've been telling yourself for a decade, it's probably got a size where it's actually bigger than you. It's bigger. Some of these kind of giants and some of these things that are bigger are external problems. Injustice and poverty can lead us to be passive because we just don't see a way through. We can be so intimidated by a crime in an area, or just seeing so many homeless people on our, on our streets that we just disengage, we go passive, we step back, and we're stuck. I, I, it's difficult to know how much we, could, we should think about this tower in West London. How do we case? How do we stay active? How do we, how do we be courageous? It's big. And then spiritual problems. Unbelief can be big. Direct spiritual attack happens and it can feel overwhelming. Ultimately, death is the biggest spiritual problem and physical problem. That is bigger than all of us. That is a very large giant. It's enough to make you want to go to bed and never leave the house. 
And that is how the devil attacks. He forms these things that are bigger than us and says, right. Saul was inadequate for the fight. Bad news is you are inadequate for your calling. And if you aren't inadequate, you're probably not doing something big enough. There is incredibly good news to come. We've read half the story. But actually, here is something that the devil doesn't want you to know. As a Christian, the devil cannot beat you. He can't wipe you out. Death has lost its sting. The devil is done. He cannot touch a hair on your head without God first giving him authority. The way he wins is by intimidating you and keeping you passive and getting you stuck. Because you can be there for years. He wins if we don't step up and take courage. And he wants you to put down your armor, go back to your tent, and wait. That is what Goliath is. That's how God attacks. That's what it means in our modern day. This intimidating force that you just feel, you know what, maybe next year it will all have gone away. But thankfully we have a new challenger. Let's read on in our passage to see the defeat of this giant. I'm going to read um, from verse 17, um, and then I'm going to uh, jump around a little bit. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this epaph of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread to your brothers and hurry to the camp. So David wasn't at the camp. He was left out. And then take these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance of them. They are with Saul and all the men in Israel in the Valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So early in the morning, he left the flock and set out as Jesse directed and he reached the camp as the army was going out to battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines and facing each other. And David left his things with the keeper of supplies and ran to the battle lines and greeted his brothers. As he was talking to them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from the lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. I'm going to jump um, forward a little bit. Um, because this is quite a long passage. But basically, David um, has a different set of eyes on this. He just sees the world in a different way and is like, you know what? Who is this guy to stand in against the people of God? And, and Saul hears of this, and we're going to hear it repeated. So verse 31. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hands of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. And then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on the sword over his tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off and he took his staff in hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in a pouch of a shepherd's bag and then with a sling in his hand he approached the Philistine. So, David, the new challenger. So we know so far in the story, if you were here last week, that God, David is God's choice for the next king. So he already has this encounter with God, and he's the, the guy who is ready to come in after Saul. He's a teenage shepherd. He's a young guy. He seems to be ineligible for the army of Israel, left behind. Um, but he's a strong, good-looking chap. That's kind of what we know about, about David. And in terms of this matchup, strengths and weaknesses, ironically, his weaknesses are exactly uh, the same as Saul's strengths. He hasn't got the experience. He's not that tall. 
But his strength is he seems to know something of God's faithfulness. There's a plan here. And, and that's what I really want to dig into. I think that there are four lessons I want to go through that can really build up courage in us that are counterintuitive when you compare them to today's uh, advice that you get on the street. So four examples that are counterintuitive. Because when the world uses this David and Goliath metaphor, they mean this. So this is Nikolai Valuev again, you know, the seven foot two ready to go. And in 2009, uh, David Hay, uh, the kind of British boxing kind of champion, uh, took on Valuev. He challenged him to a fight. And all the newspapers couldn't resist. This is David against Goliath. This young guy, he's going to get beaten around the park. And David Hay, you know, David Hay won. He was uh, faster and more fleet of foot, and he beat the, uh, beat the giant. It came down to his exceptional skill and his self-belief. When the world talks about David and Goliath, they are talking about you being cleverer and you believing in yourself. And that is not the biblical story at all. If you are going to be courageous based on your uh, self-belief and your self-skill, you're going to end up like Saul. And I want to tell you that actually the, what fuels David's courage these four things that fuel David's courage are completely different to self-belief because he worships a mighty God. So, first of all, oh, that's a shame. That's actually not meant to be there. It's meant to be a picture um, first. Is it going to be the same for all of them? Oh, that's a shame. I've got some really lovely internet memes that have pretty flowers uh, and tell you all these wonderful um, kind of courageous thoughts, but I'm going to have to explain them to you. So, so myth number one. If you can believe it, then you can achieve it. Like self-belief. Like you can do it. This is what your friends tell you when you're having a tough time. Like you can do it. Like that's really encouraging because often you can. But sometimes, sometimes you can't. <laughs> like sometimes Goliath is bigger than Saul. You know, a lot of my friends are, love starting new businesses. Like, it's, it's a huge thing to do with, like, startups now. And, and loads of my friends have just amazing business ideas. And some of them have these weird, half-baked ideas that don't make any sense. And all their friends tell them, oh, that's really great. Like, if you believe in this, it'll really work. And it might. But is that the source of courage? Well, it might go horribly, horribly wrong. Like, if you believe that you can jump from the top of the, the, the kind of the building to the bottom, like, you might believe it, but it might go horribly, horribly wrong. David has a completely different point of view. He says, the, the, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Actually, what David seems to say is something very, very different. Verse 37, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. It's not self-belief, it's belief in the mighty, omnipotent power of the God who created the world and actually has authority over the problem. Self-belief, no. It will get you so far, but it won't help you defeat the real giants. In verse 46, they're in battle. Goliath has just been like, I'm going to tear you open and throw your, your meat to the, to the, to the birds. You come against me, David says, with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day, the Lord will deliver you unto me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. All things are possible for him who believes this is not self-belief. David and Goliath is a story about impossibilities that the mighty God of Israel can perform. And if the basis of your courage is the almighty saviour of the world to whom we've been singing, that is a much sturdier basis than I'm quite tall, I'm quite strong, I can do exams quite well. It's a better basis for courage and your courage will be stronger. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I believe in him. That's David's stance. 
The Lord rescued me from the paw of the lion. I come against you in the name of the Lord. This day the Lord will deliver you. That's courage. That's something to get excited about. Hmm. Self, uh, another thing I've written here that I forgot. Self-belief is quite lonely. Like my, my little startup friends who are on their own, it's quite, you've got to really work hard. You've got to really kind of just get, get yourself up. But, but actually, do you realize that, that one of the bases of our courage is that we are never alone? Always under the mighty hand of God. Always on his path and his, and his plan. Always in community with the saints to share us along. Self-belief is quite lonely and can often lead you to self-deception. But belief in the Lord means you are never alone. He is God with us. That's the basis of our courage. The second um, piece of advice I want to say won't give you courage is hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Some, I mean, this will kind of hit home with some people more than others. For, for me, I don't know about you, but sometimes like, pr- the preparation I do, just basically, you know, the idea of my preparation is so I can have a better life, but it ends up meaning that I just can't live at all. Have you ever spent so much time on holiday preparing what you're going to do the next day that you just completely miss the morning you've, uh, you've kind of set out? You haven't kind of left the, the croissant at your, your breakfast table yet. Sometimes the defences we build around us are the things that trap us in our immobility. Sometimes the things that we say, okay, well, I'm going to go and do this thing that's been on my heart and that God's calling me to for ages, but first of all, I'm going to do this, and first of all, I'm going to do this, first of all, I'm going to do this, and yeah, I'm really ready to go out and to to kind of do this kind of bold thing for God, but but actually, I need to kind of make sure I've got, I've got, got my protection up. And just this image of David being given this amazing protection of Saul, the armor and the spear, and the, so he looks the part. Like, that's wise. Well done you. That's a wise thing to do. Is it wise all the time? Sometimes we need to just go out there in faith and courage. Um, and sometimes, and, I, and, and, and you know, this, is, this is more nuanced, sometimes you know, we have to be wise in the Lord, not wise in worldly terms. Sometimes you just have to be courageous uh, and go for it. It's, it's really strange. Like, I, so um, this isn't courageous, um, but, but it's an example. When I told my friends that I was getting married last year, um, and it was really exciting, and that we were just getting our house sorted, and that we were about to kind of, you know, get married and then move in together, one of my, some of my, my friends were very frequently like, what, you're, you're going to move in with your fiancé after you get married? Like, you're not already living together. Um, and, and the way they said it was as if I was being so completely unwise. Like, that's a stupid thing to do. Like, you're, ris- you're risking a lot of heartache here. But actually, no. Like, the, there's a different wisdom. Uh, we believed ourselves to be very wise. And, and uh, you know, and we followed the word. And sometimes it took courage to say, well, actually, no. This, this is the way. Uh, and, and we can follow it with courage. So David didn't take the armor of Saul. No thanks. That's a trap. So sometimes we can be too defensive. And the thing we say is not, um, uh, sorry, I've got got the the kind of counter example here. And, And the protection we need, actually, from the same psalm, David says this, the Lord is the stronghold of my life, in whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is the stronghold. He's not only the basis of the attacking power, he's the protection in defense. That's a basis for courage. Not my little armor and not my little defenses, but the Lord's. The third one is a little bit more, um, perhaps a little bit more controversial. My third piece of wisdom that I want to say does not lead to courage at all times is let go and let God. Now, I say a bit more controversial because that phrase, let go and let God, can be so suitable for some seasons of life. Seasons of surrender, of heartache. When you've kind of come to the point where you are want to let go of your rights, if you want to let go of the control of your past, if you've got this unforgiveness in you, letting go and letting God minister to you is the right answer. But it's a very active thing. If you find yourself saying, let go and let God, that's an active 
thing where you're really putting yourself out there and you are being courageous by doing that. But actually, there are times when courage and overcoming is about going out there and doing something and about David stepping out. David didn't see Goliath and then say, it's okay, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to pray until God makes the, 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 the thing fall over on his own accord. Sometimes, when there's an intimidating attack, we need courage to go out and to meet it head on. And it's in the battlefield God shows us his strength and his protection. So yes, let go and let God. If you're trying to get rid of uh, something that's, that's you know, that, like an unforgiveness. But when we're talking about courage, I want to say that when the wicked advance against me, it is them who will stumble and fall. Though they may besiege me, my heart will not fear Though war break out against me, even then I'll be confident. Like this is about David's courage was a courage that was active and it was in the battlefield. And sometimes uh, it's just that, that, that action, that movement of faith that can bring things down. I've got one more. And this is um, the basis of a lot of courage in our society. And the one that we have the biggest keys to, to think differently on. You only live once. That's what people say when they want people to be courageous. You only live once. You know, don't waste this chance to have a really full experience. Like, you've got to choose to go and make a name for yourself. What's there to lose? Go out there and do it. But actually, our motivation is so, so different. We know that courage in this life can not only lead us to freedom, but can lead us to reward in the the life to come. And we know that we can act in a way that has meaning for eternity. We don't only live once. David says this, One thing I ask of the Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. The motivation behind this courage is that I just just want to come and be close to God and be obedient to him. I just want to see God's name become famous. Can you see the zeal that that David has for the Lord? He knows that he he is battling for the Lord and that he actually can achieve uh, a dwelling with God and peace with God for his great name. These are the the forms of the courage. And actually, these um, passages I've read out are actually part of the same psalm of David. And so I just want to read them out again as this kind of antidote or or this kind of way of being courageous, starting at 27.1a. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Actually, can we read these out together? Would that be right? So um, kind of three, two, one. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. In whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me, it is them who will stumble and fall. Though an army may besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That is where courage comes from. If there's one kind of summary, not self-belief, faith in the Lord, like he is bigger. But this is what it all comes down to. Intimidation works like this. Intimidation is Saul thinking, oh my gosh, like that, that Goliath thing is much bigger than me. And what it means is that there's afraidness and there's passivity, you step back. And actually Saul doesn't get the reward. That is the picture because you know, David is smaller than Saul. Saul is smaller than the, than the giant. But actually, what does, what's the key to this? What is courage? Courage is saying that Goliath is smaller than God. It's a completely different frame of reference. The problems that are holding you back in passivity, they are bigger than you. But they are smaller than God. 
And when you advance, you advance with the blessing of the Father, with the heavenly hosts and the angels coming behind you in power. And they will not let your foot stumble. If you're in his will, they will not let your foot stumble. So the question becomes, not how big is the problem. The question becomes, are you on his side? Are you on God's side? Are you in his army? Are you one with the heavenly hosts? Are you going forward? And are you ready to take these spiritual powers on? And I want to tell you, if you um, know the Lord Jesus as your king, then you are part of that army and you are on his side. If you have that cry within you, that, that, that cry we read in the psalm that goes like this, one thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. If you want to be with him and you have that love for him, you're on his side. Because the biggest Goliath that has ever been in your life, the biggest threat to your flourishing and your existence was Satan's hold of you in death. We all were once dead in our transgressions and sins and in unbelief. And this giant wasn't yours to slay. Let me picture one last scene for you. There's an army over here on this hill, and then there's another army on this hill. This is the army of, of, of you know, Satan and evil. This is the kind of the enemies of God are over here. And over here are, are people who are, who, who are terrified. Because in the middle stands Satan, stands this big, ominous giant, and he represents sin and death. And he stands over these people and says, I've got a hold of you. Come and fight me, take me on. If you think you're righteous, come and take me on. And the setup is like David and Goliath, right? If Satan wins, then, 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 then he's got everyone. But if a champion can come, if one, one champion can come and can defeat the devil, then all the people of God can march in and be free. And who did God send? Not David. He sent an ancestor of David, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. So we've got to imagine the giant and then out comes the lamb. He looks pretty insignificant. But Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, crucified for us, went down to hell and defeated Satan. So all of the people of God can go free. There's the picture of, of Jesus in, in this picture. We, we've, we found him. So of all the, 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 the courage that we have to muster to, to break through these smaller giants, to break through and to become who we meant to be. We know that we are part of his people. We know that we are part of his army because Jesus slayed the biggest giant. And Jesus on the cross managed to defeat us so we can go free. Let's follow in his example. Let's be full of courage, but not in our own strength. Let's go forth and be in the courage of the, with the, the faith that can move mountains because we know the God who created the mountain. We know the God who is all-powerful and almighty. And he allows us to go forth and to be victorious and to have a meaningful life. Not sat back waiting for him to do everything, but going forward, collaborating with him to come and to have real meaning. And one day we will come to him in full. So I just want to leave you this picture. I did have more. Um, I'm not going to go there, although it's quite fun. Um, this is the big picture. So I've asked you to kind of help me here and, and be working out through this, this talk, you know, what, like if there's that thing that just makes you just go on the back foot, if there's that, that, that thing that means you're just not running, the thing that's made you stuck, I would just ask you to kind of think about this picture, you know, that, that, that actually... Compared to the mighty power of God, how can we try and learn a new courage? 
not to try and pull ourselves up by bootstraps again, to try and muster up the strength again, to try and not do that again, to try and not think that again in our own strength, but taking it to God, confessing, look, Lord, this is bigger than me, but Lord, you are the high king. Give me your power. And in that resurrection power that came from the Lord Jesus Christ, um, let's try and go forward as a church and be courageous. I'm going to uh, pray. Um, and if, if the band could come up, uh, that would be, um, that'd be really great. I realized I didn't tell you the end of the story. David wins, um, by the way. Uh, he goes forward. And it's not because he's really skillful, although he's good. So God uses that, but it's because... Anyway, um, I'll pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, to whom we have been singing these incredibly large songs to, Lord, the Lord of hosts, the creator, the Alpha and the Omega, the Ancient of Days, the Lord of the hosts of splendor. Lord, I thank you that you are for us and not against us. Champion of heaven, you have made a way for us to enter into freedom. And Lord, I thank you that in you, you will not let a hair of our head fall to the ground without your blessing. So, Lord, we, we thank you for that foundation. And, Lord, right now, we hold up to you the reality of our problem, of that addiction, of that depression, of that, that, that physical injury, Lord, that is denying us joy. And we declare that it is bigger than us. But Lord, you are mighty. And by your power, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit that we would be courageous. Lord, not with this kind of false optimism, but Lord, knowing and knowing deep within our soul that you are mighty, you are for us, and you have a plan for us. And we pray that you would teach us to enter into flourishing and joy. And that you would give us the courage to make, uh, to make a difference for you in obedience. Lord, we love you. And we pray that you would minister to us now. You'll send your Holy Spirit, Lord God. Will you speak in a way that I just couldn't? Lord, will you move? Lord, will you unlock things uh, that, that, that I am unable to? And Holy Spirit, Lord, will you bring words? And will you bring freedom as we sing? Amen. Amen. So the band is going to play. Um, in this church, we love to be able to pray with people. So um, we will have people on the left and on the right um, who, if you are particularly stirred by anything or if you just want someone to support you in saying amen, we're not alone in this courage, um, then we can say amen with you. If you want to pray with friends, that's great. But I'd encourage you to um, be listening to him uh, and to be speaking to him and praying.